Well, brethren, today I want to give you a message. This is a, another part of uh, in the series on what's so bad about sin. And I'm calling this one the, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, God's Law. You know, we oftentimes don't think of that, but God, you know, the law of God or God's law is the moral logic of the universe. It's what God created to be all-encompassing, to touch all aspects of our life, not only what we do, but also what we think and all the things as we go through in the course of this life. It's a remarkable thing. Turn with me to Psalm, Psalm uh, number one, the first Psalm in the Bible, and in verse one. Now, those of us who've been in the church of God for many years know this Psalm because we used to sing it on a regular basis. Okay, it's one of those things we would do in services. But anyways, it's Psalm one, in verse one, I'll read this in the New Living Translation. Oh, the joys who, who do not follow, those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mark mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord. Yes, those who, you know, they don't stand with the sinners, they don't join in with the mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Think about that. You're having to give serious thought. You're having to look at it and consider its meaning. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves never, never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Well, you know, one might think, a simple reading over here of the, these first few verses, these first six verses of Psalm 1, that this would really settle for really anyone with an open mind the question of whether the people of God should live by that real hitchhiker's guide to the universe, God's law. You would think it would settle it. You know, the fact that, you know, this, 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 this whole system, this whole way of thinking, of acting, of doing this standard of, of, of righteousness, you know, we would think that, you know, as expressed here in Psalm 1, that this would immediately, reading this, any good person of goodwill would understand that it is their obligation that, yes, they want to delight in the law of the Lord. Well, you might think that, but you might think wrong in doing that. Human beings, you know, the human nature being what it is, they, we naturally don't like to hear about something that we should do, something that we should obey. You know, especially the theologians, you know, they don't give up easily when it comes to a question of whether one really has to obey the scriptures, whether one really has to obey the word of God. This moral logic of the universe. Well, turn with me to Luke 10. I wanted to see you because this attitude is, there's nothing new about this. People like love to argue and they will argue all day long and next year and the year after that, they want to minimize, 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 minimize. See, they're, they're really those who are biblical minimalists. They want to do the absolutely very littlest amount. They want to derive, you should say, well, I just want to confess. I want to say something with my mouth but actually to have to realize that they have to be meditating to delight on the law of the Lord and to meditate it all the day and night. Wow. You know, there's a lot there. That, that you know, bothers a lot of people. It bothers many theologians in mainstream Christianity. If we go to Luke 10, verse 25, this, this is nothing new, though. Jesus himself experienced it. We get one day, and I'm going to recite this one in the New Living Translation, Luke 10, and starting in verse 25. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him a question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, and then I, you know, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? This was not a minor question, okay? And Jesus, was he going to dodge it? 
Was Jesus going to dodge this question from this, you know, from the scribe? Jesus replied, and notice what he asked. Yes, what does the law of Moses say? Oh, he, he's referring specifically to the scriptures. He's referring specifically to the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. How do you read it? Jesus said. And the man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right! Jesus told them. Do this and you will live. Wow. Okay, he, he got it right on the money. But that wasn't going to be good enough. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Okay, the guy is, you know, we'd call him a lawyer these days. You know, he wanted to specify, he sees what is written in the, in the word of God, okay, the, you know, about loving God, but then when it comes to this part about loving neighbor, he wanted to see, ask him, and who is my neighbor? What is this, is this, you know, who am I, you know, because he wants, is Jesus made the point, he wanted to justify his actions because he wasn't loving his neighbor. He looked into the scriptures and looked at how he was behaving towards certain people, maybe people of a different ethnic group, <laughs> maybe some relatives, I don't know, whatever it might have been. He wanted to justify his actions, saying, well, they're not my neighbor, if I can treat them like dirt. Well, see, what you see here in Luke 10 in this account that Jesus uh, was talking about, you see carnal human nature. Well, there's that lovely phrase, carnal human nature, arguing you know, literally with the word of God in person in order to find an out. He's looking for a loophole, looking for an exemption, an excuse, some rationale that would uh, help him to avoid doing what he didn't want to do. See, that was his motivation. That was his idea. Much of mainstream Christianity these days is just like this lawyer. They're looking for loopholes. They're looking for an excuse. They're looking for a theological argument to avoid doing what the Word of God teaches, plainly teaches. Let's go and see, take a look here what the Apostle Paul had to say about this. Let's take a what, uh, let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. Yeah, the Apostle Paul knew something about the carnal human nature. He had, he'd seen a lot of it in the course of his ministry. Romans 8 and verse 5, I'll read this in uh, the expanded Bible version. Those who live, it says, following their sinful selves, that is their sinful nature, their flesh, those who live following their sinful selves think only about, that is, they have their minds set on, they have their outlook, their opinions shaped by the things that their sinful selves want. They only think about what they want. But those following the Spirit are thinking about, that is to say, they're having their minds set on, they have their outlook shaped by the things the Spirit wants them to do. The people's thinking is controlled. If a people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self, in other words, by the flesh, in the, the old way King James would put it, if people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self, there is death. See, the result is death. But if the thinking is controlled by the spirit, there is life and peace. When people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self, the flesh, they are against, they are hostile to God because they refuse to obey, they refuse to submit to God's law and really are not even able to obey God's law. They're not able to. See, this is the incredible thing here that Paul is remarking. If people are focusing on 
the sinful desires, uh, the carnal nature, the, that carnal human nature, the flesh, you know, different translations will put it different ways. You know, he's saying, you know, if, if they refuse to obey it, they're not even, you know, they, they don't want to hear it, they don't want to do it. You know, this is where we are right now in North America in particular, but not just North America, but all over the world. We want to, we want to say here, let's, let's go to Isaiah. I want you to look at this, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2. See, the dominant attitude of our society right now, here in Canada, in the United States of America, and Great Britain, and France, and Germany and Russia and China and any place else you want to go in this world is like this. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2. I'll stay with the New Living Translation for a moment. Listen, O heavens, pay attention, O earth. This is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for. Okay, the Lord is saying that the children of Israel, who this is addressed to, he's calling them his children. The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. Even an ox knows its owner, and a donkey recognizes its master's care. But Israel, okay, let's not just hammer, you know, the Jews. Let's say, but, but Israel, let's say Canada, but let's say America, the United States of America, let's say Britain, let's say Australia, let's say Germany, let's say France, let's say Russia, let's say China. A donkey recognizes its master's care, but you people, whoever you are who are hearing this in your nation doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. Oh, what a sinful nation they are, loaded down with a burden of guilt. They are evil people, corrupt children who have rejected the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Doesn't that describe our society right now? Here in Canada, here in the United States of America, here wherever it is that you're living, why do you continue to invite punishment? Must you rebel forever? Your head is injured? Yeah, uh, the, the governing, governments, the ruling elite, yeah, it's injured. And your heart is sick. You are battered from head to foot, covered with bruises and welts and infected wounds without any soothing ointments or bandages. Your country lies in ruins and your towns are burned. Foreigners plunder your fields before your eyes and destroy everything they see. Of course, when Isaiah wrote this, this was very true of what was going on. In the northern ten tribes of Israel, they were being wiped out by the Assyrians and their, the allies of the Assyrians. How long will it be before this happens in North America. Well, I think it's beginning already if you look at what's really going on. Foreigners plunder your fields before your eyes and destroy everything they see. Yes, the head is injured. It's unsound and the heart is sick. It does not describe, they've, you know, our nations have turned their back on God. Now let's go, but however, in all of this, in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2, God calls those who are supposed to be living in covenant, in relationship with him, he calls them his children. If you are a Christian, you are in covenant with God. You're in relation with God. He has a covenant, and it's in this book. The terms are in this book. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy 14. Deuteronomy 14. See, he gives us, as it were, the hitchhiker's guide to the universe, his law, that moral logic of the universe. Deuteronomy 14 in verse 1. I want to read this one. You are the children, or literally it's the sons, of the Lord your God. You are the sons of the Lord your God. Moses was writing in dictation. When someone dies, do not cut yourselves, or that is, don't lacer lacerate or gash yourselves or shave your heads. 
You are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. He has chosen you from all the people of the earth to be his very own. To be a special treasure, as it talks about in Exodus 19 and verses 5 to 6. Verse 3, do not eat anything that the Lord hates or anything that God finds detestable or abominable in the way of being food. He, de he defines this more fully in Leviticus 11. And then he says in verse 4, he starts specifying these are the animals you may eat, you know, oxen, sheep, goats, deer, gazelle, roe deer, wild goats, ibex, antelope, mountain sheep. He goes on, you know, for here, as God's special people, okay, he starts how you're not to mourn, not to cut yourself, because you're God's sons, not that you have no hope. I mean, we are his, you are his holy people. And then he goes on to talk about these different animals that you're to eat and what you're not supposed to eat. And he may specify, the scriptures will also specify how you are to kill it. Now, God did not give his celestial hitchhiker's guide to the universe as his law, or then the Hebrew would use the term his Torah, his instruction <clears throat> to his special people because he wanted to punish them. He did it because he hated them and wanted to tie all these burdensome stuff on them. See, that's the attitude a lot of people have. But you see, that's the carnal mind that is hostile to the word of God. It doesn't want to be subject to it, doesn't want to obey it. No, there are many people who say that because God hated these people, he gave them his Torah, he gave them his law. But that's not what he says. It's not what he says. Let's go to 1 John. Let's go into your New Covenant Scriptures and your Greek Bible. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And verse 4. I'm going to read this in the Culture Translation. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Apostle John wrote this. This is the apostle Jesus loved. Everyone who practices sin is also practicing lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. Now, <clears throat> literally, according to the interlinear Bible, it says this. You know, if you're going to look in the Greek, everyone doing sin also lawlessness does. And sin is lawlessness. I mean, to put it in this kind of the stilted, straightforward, you know, just the Greek, everyone doing sin uh, also, uh, do, uh, also lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Going back to Coulter, verse 5, And you know that he, that is Jesus Christ, appeared in order that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. See, Christ came to take away our sins, to pay the price for our sins. And he never sinned. In him is no sin. Sin is, is something that is detestable, that's abominable in his sight. Everyone who dwells in him, it says, the apostle writes, does not practice sin. If we say we're Christians, we can't be practicing sin as our lifestyle. Okay, it's, it's, it's something we, 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 have to, we have to pay attention. Anyone who practices sin okay, as, a, as a habit, this is something we're habitually doing every week, week in and week out, ignoring the word of God, just doing our thing, has not seen him nor known him. If we're ignoring the word of God, you know, we can't say that, you know, the, well, the apostle saying you don't know him. You're not what you, you claim yourselves to be. Everyone who dwells in him does not practice sin. Anyone who practices sin has not seen him nor known him. Little children, again, you know, John is using this, uh, little children, do not allow anyone to deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. That's the standard. The one who practices sin is of the devil. It's, you know, it's the, other, it's the other way. You know, it's of the other way. Nevertheless, 
you know, from what we have, mainstream Christianity does not accept what the scriptures have to say here. Doesn't do it. Rather, they will typically interpret, you know, scripture like Colossians 2.14, and they'll argue that the way of faith means that Christ nailed God's law to the cross, so they no longer have to obey it. Yet as I pointed out in my message, what does Colossians 2 say that I, I gave earlier this month, it was originally given on August 2nd this year, I noted that, and I'll cite here Colossians 2.14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And I explained, you know, the, 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 the Greek word here is chirographon, and to use a, the, the analogy, because this term was used in financial transactions, what Christ did is like burning our spiritual mortgage that was held by the bank of Satan. You know, that's an amazing thing. But he canceled our spiritual mortgage, the record of debt that was held by Satan, the devil. And it stood against us. He's claiming our lives, because that's, you know, the end result, the wages of sin is death. But Christ did that for us. The chirographon, as I mentioned, is, it's a handwritten document. It's a legal note. It's a bond. It's a handwriting that one has written with his own hand. And I talked about that earlier, how a debtor would typically write out in hand his own note because it would show that it was you. It was genuine because everyone's handwriting is always a little dis is distinctive. It's, it's unique. You can tell whose handwriting it is, and it was true as then as it is right, right, right now. What was nailed to the cross was a record of our own personal sins that we personally committed and wrote with our own hands. And it is that that was nailed to the cross. Our sins. Not the law of God. Contrary to what so many people in the mainstream have taught. Now, the Apostle Paul you know, demolishes the mainstream what I would call antinomian or anomian theological argument saying that God's law was done away when he says this. Read this. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 31. And we'll, we'll read this in the Amplified Bible version. Romans 3, 31. Do we then by this faith make the law of no effect? Now Paul asks a question. It's a very modern question. You could turn on the TV any, any Sunday and you probably hear the same thing. Question, do we then by this faith make the law of no effect? And most of the preachers are going to say, Amen, brother! Yeah, hallelujah! Yes. That's what they're going to say, aren't they? Practical fact. I mean, you know, what they think is, you know, God just wants you to be happy. Do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, if it feels good, do it. That's what we've gotten to in our society, isn't it? And in the churches, they just endorse it. And the governments make laws allowing it. Do whatever you like. We totally ignore whatever's in the scriptures. Paul asks the questions, Romans 3.31, do we then by this faith make the law of no effect? Overthrow it or make it a dead letter. How does Paul answer it? Certainly not. On the contrary, we confirm and establish and uphold the law. Oh. Oh. Paul's not very modern, is he? <laughs> he is not. You know, the Greek word here that Paul is using for law is Strong 3551. I've talked about this. Nomos. It's the law, the scripture, with an emphasis, you know, it's primarily, as they would say, uh, the first five books of the Bible. Not just the Ten Commandments. First five books of the Bible. Talking everything, the stories, the examples, the, you know, do this, don't do that, this sort of thing. What happens when you do this? What happens, you know, all the different things. It's all there. It's all part of the nomos, or in Hebrew, the word is Torah, as Strong's 8451, 
This is the same Hebrew word that appears in Psalms 1, and we just read it, chapter 1 and verse uh, 2. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. This is Torah, and it means direction, instruction. And third, they put law. Brown Driver and Briggs says it's a body of teaching, instruction in the Messianic age, direction, or instruction related to sacred things. It's talking about law in both its gen most generic application and its specific applications. And codes of law as well, Torah. It has all those meanings. It's very, it's very broad. Now this idea of the law of God and how it relates to the church, you know, this has been a subject of a great controversy for a very long time. In fact, it's one of the oldest controversies we have in Christianity. Heron and Brown, in their book, Christ and Celtic Christianity, <clears throat> which was published by the Boydell Press in 2012, they say this on page 106. They say, <clears throat> British Christianity, that is the Christianity that was practiced in the British Isles in the 400s to mid-600s A.D., and they add, whether monastic or lay, <clears throat> was governed by a total reliance on the authority of the scriptures, the corollary of which was a marked distrust of any theology that was not scripturally based. They didn't trust this theology <clears throat> of popular culture, the theology of allegorical wishful thinking. They didn't trust that. They, would, they said here, and in, in, uh, Heron and Brown write, for them, quote, it must never be forgotten that God reveals his law through the written word. The complete law is contained in the scriptures and examples are given in both testaments to help us in our quest for perfect obedience to the law. That's what they thought. That's what the Celtic Christians thought. The common Celtic church, what Heron Brown called the common Celtic church of the 400s to mid 600s, refer to four sources in the historical documents of divine law. That is, the Torah or Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The prophets, like Isaiah, which I cited earlier. The gospels, which I've already quoted out of Luke and the apostles, and I've already been quoting from the scriptures of the apostle John and the apostle Paul. Okay, so we're, you know, I'm in good stead here doing this. I'm following you know, their, their, you know, what they did so many years before. Those Celtic Christians saw the divine law as a unitary. They saw it holistically. And it, they, they perceived it at the very core of their Christianity. It was the responsibility to find its direct application to their daily life because they built their lifestyle on it. It informed them of what they did and the choices they made. There's a lot to say about this from that standpoint. But we'll talk about more about that in, in the future, about all these people. You know, the early medieval Celtic church would struggle overtly with what Heron and Brown call the Romani. That is the Church of Rome and those who were following the Church of Rome and those who wanted to enforce on them the universal or Catholic theology that was especially being coming up with the, the, the new version of it from Augustinian, the version of the theology. But for several centuries, they resisted that, from the 400s to the mid-600s. And then for another three or four centuries, it was covert. You find you know, historic references to you know, those people, those pernicious people who continue to do these terrible things of, of actually living by the word of God. One of the favorite things, and I want to, um, you know, they love to quote the Apostle Paul in, in 2 Timothy where, you know, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof. This, this, this was at the core of what they perceived. And that's not at the core of where the mainstream of the Christian church was going. 
in the 400s, and it's certainly not at the core of where the mainstream Christian church is in the 21st century. Not much has changed from that aspect. The law of God, or the toros in Hebrew, or the nomos in Greek, does cover just all aspects of living for, for all people. You know, it includes, there are discussions in it when you look through the, the, look through the Bible in the, in, the, in the first five books. It talks about cleanliness with tattoos, sex, finances, slander, gossip, injustice. All the things that are still issues now, aren't they? There were issues back then. Still issues now. But most people don't have a clue. So it talked about actions, but it also included aspects the law of God, the Torah, the nomos also included aspects of how a person thought and their mindset. Things like greed and pride and envy and hypocrisy. They were also part of the law of God. Those who reject God's standards of conduct, who, re who reject this lifestyle that is taught by the scriptures, in his teaching, taught in his teaching, taught by this instruction, you know, what is the end result? What are they in fact doing? Those people who argue against the Torah, who argue against the nomos, who argue against the law of God, who want to say it's all done away. Who are they arguing against, really, when it comes down to it? Turn with me into the uh, general epistles, the epistle of, of John. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. The Apostle John, written towards the end of the first century, 1 John chapter 2. He was the last apostle standing. And when he wrote these things, he wanted to make sure it was preserved for all time for the church of what the real deal was, because he already saw the mystery of iniquity was already at work. The mystery of lawlessness was already at work at the Apostle John's lifetime. And he wrote these things specifically for this. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, and yet if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. Yeah, he is the atoning sacrifice. The atoning sacrifice for the guilt that we have personally, individually incurred the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this standard, we know that we know him. Okay, here's how we know that we actually know Christ. We know the, you know, the, the, the what's the Bible, the one who is a source of life. If we keep his commandments, John said, if we keep his commandments, the one who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. The truth is not there. Did you hear what, what, what John, the apostle, is saying to you? The one who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. If you know this, then why are you listening, if you do, to people who don't know Christ? And they don't know the truth. The truth aren't in them. And yet you listen to them on Sunday. The, sun, the, the funnies. And yet most people do. And they continue to follow that. Verse 5, on the other hand, if anyone is keeping his word, keeping his word, truly in this one the love of God is being perfected. See, keeping the, the word of God it means that the love of God is going to be perfected because it works in us. It develops us over the years. We grow into the stature of Christ. By this means, we know that we are in him. Now, if we're going to grow into the stature of Christ, as I said, you know, it, you know the, the, the law talks about actions, but it also talks about mindset. Let's go to James, James chapter 4 and verse 17. Apostle James, who was in actually, actuality Jesus' half-brother. They had the same mother. Different fathers. James' father with Joseph. By the way, they think, uh, and it seems highly uh, 
highly possible that actually the ossuary in which, which held the apostle James Bones uh, was discovered here in, in the 20th century. I think, the, I think it's around the James, they call it the James ossuary. Anyways, a real historical person, one of the writers of the Bible, James says this in chapter 4 and verse 17 in the expanded Bible version. Therefore, anyone who knows the right thing to do, you know the right thing to do because you've been studying the scripture, you've been taught, you're attending church, you're hearing the word of God preach. You know what the right thing is to do. But does not do it is sinning. Now, the New Living Translation puts it with this verse 17 this way. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Perhaps that's the reason why so many of the theologians and others, they, they, they ignore the word of God. They ignore the law because, they, you know, they, 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 they don't want to know what to do. Then it's uh, from that aspect and... Not doing it's not going to be sin for them? Well, it doesn't quite work that way, does it? Ignorance of the law isn't going to save you from that standpoint. How do I know that? Well, let's hear. Let's go Luke chapter 12 and verse 47. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke. Which is this. You want to put it, it's Paul's Gospel, written by his the beloved physician who is Luke's companion, uh, Paul's companion Luke. Anyways, Luke chapter 12 and verse 47. I'll read this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And that slave, or servant, depending upon the translation you have, and that slave that knew his master's will and didn't prepare himself or do it will be severely beaten. See, knowledge, there is an accountability. There, there's an accountability. If you know your master's will and you don't prepare yourself or you don't do it, to prepare yourself to do his will and do it, you'll be severely beaten, verse 48. But the one who did not know and did things deserving of blows will be beaten lightly. Much will be required of everyone who has been given much, and even more will be expected of the one who has been entrusted with more. We are accountable for what we understand. God shows that very clearly. But to say that there is no accountability if you can complete ignorance is, is foolish. Because, of course, even Jesus says, you know, the one who did not know and did things deserving of blows will be beaten, however, will be lightly. Those who stand up there and preach and then know better and do whatever, they get beaten heavily. I mean, if you look at some of the televangelist scandals that uh, were renowned in the late 20th century, you'll see a little of that. Let's go to Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark in chapter 7. If you know to do good and don't do it, hmm, then there are going to be problems. Mark chapter 7. I'll read this one in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Okay, these were people who should have known the will of God, who studied the, will, uh, the word of God a lot. They said, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating bread that with ritually defiled hands? Oh, in verse 6, he answered them, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites, saying, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. That's without practical effect, worthlessly. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrine the commands of men. Not the commands of God, the commands of men. The whole issue was about, oh, why, you know, eating with unwashed hands which defiled them, made them common. Verse 9, he also said to them, you completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. Well, isn't that what's going on right now? 
The mainstream doesn't keep the Sabbath. They keep Sunday. That's their human tradition. They don't keep Passover. They keep Easter. They don't keep like what's upcoming, the Feast of Trumpets or the Day of Atonement. No, they do Christmas and Halloween. You completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. For Moses said, what? Honor your father and mother. And whoever speaks evil of father and mother must be put to death. Okay, He's citing one of the Big Ten Commandments. But you say if a man tells his father or mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me is Corban. That is a gift committed to the temple. You no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. You revoke God's word by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many other similar things. You see, the, the financially supporting one's elderly parent wasn't laid out or specified in the Torah. But you were to honor them. And what did that mean? What was the spirit of the law? That meant you took care of them. You did good. If anyone knows to do good... If anyone knows the right thing to do but does not doing, do it, it is sinning. You ought, if you know what you ought to do and then don't do it, it's sin. See, the scribes and the Pharisees in this, they knew that they should be taking care of their parents, their elderly parents, and they weren't doing it, and it was sin. They were invalidating God's command when they came up with this whole thing where, oh, I don't like you, so whatever I might give to you, I'm going to put in the, you know, the temple treasury you know, to conduct the service and this sort of thing. You know, it'd be like saying today, you know, I'm going to just give it to the church and you can go rot on the, you know, rot on the street corner. It's a homeless person. I'm not going to take care of my parents. You know, I, don't like, I didn't like what my mom did when she used to spank me when I was a kid or whatever it is, whatever excuse you come up with. Yeah, financially supporting one's elderly parents, you know, wasn't, specific, wasn't specified. But the command said, honor your father and mother. And Jesus was pointing out that, you know, it, it, it implied that very clearly. Now, if you go to Leviticus 19.18, and let's just turn to that here for just a second. Let's go to Leviticus 19.18. Some people who will say, well, maybe we should do something about the law, and, and they'll say, well, maybe just the Ten Commandments, you know, from this, from this standpoint. <clears throat> the book of Leviticus is not part of the Ten Commandments, okay? But it's part of what is really is part of the Torah. It's part of the law. 1918, it says, you shall not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And Jesus, when he was asked by the lawyer, you know, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? You know, he got it right when he said, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, but in your neighbor as yourself. It was part of the law of God, even if it wasn't part of the Ten Commandments. See, this is, this is something that people sometimes get trapped in. Let's go to James. You know, if we're going to love our neighbors or self, how do we do this? Apostle James talked about this. James chapter 2 and verse 14. <clears throat> of course, there are a whole bunch of people who don't like the Apostle James. A lot of people in, you know, in, in Protestantism don't like the Apostle James because of what he writes. They can't stand what he writes, actually. But you ought to tell you something about the people who make those comments. James chapter 2 and verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but has not works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you say to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat well. But you don't give them what the body needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. But Apostle James is saying, show me your faith without works and I will show you faith from my works. Yes, 
if we know to do good and don't do it, then it is sin, isn't it? Let's go to Romans, Romans chapter 14 here. Romans chapter 14. Yeah. Romans chapter 14, and we'll start here in verse 13. Therefore, we should no longer judge one another, but judge this instead. Do not put an occasion of stumbling or a cause of offense before your brother. Okay, so in other words, Apostle Paul is saying, look at what you're doing. Are you creating a problem for somebody else from what you're doing? I understand and persuaded by the Lord Jesus that nothing is common of itself. Now, many versions will say nothing is unclean, but the Greek word here is koinos. It's properly common. Common in the terminology of, of the Bible is something that is clean that has been misused or defiled, not done in an appropriate way. But of itself, it's clean. It's, it's okay. It's pure. But then something happens, it's not properly done. With an animal, it's like if an animal is clean, like a cow or, or a beef cow or a goat or a sheep, they're clean animals. But if you don't kill them the right way, or if they get hit by a car on the side of the road these days, they become common because they weren't bled properly. They weren't slaughtered correctly. And the Apostle Paul is saying this, I understand and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that nothing is common of itself. Referring very clearly to Apostle Peter's vision of talking about a human being. See, there weren't clean and unclean people. In God's sight, we're all clean. We're all human. We all have the potential to be his children. Okay? We're not, you know, and, but nor are we common, you know. And, and, and the apostle is saying, I understand and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that nothing is common of itself except to the one who regards anything to be common. To that one it is common. But if... Because of me, your brother is offended. You are no longer walking according to love. With your meat, do not destroy the one whom Christ died. Because the issue here was buying it in, you know, in, in the Greek, among the Greeks. If you went to the local supermarket and you bought something, it wasn't killed maybe by a kosher butcher. That might offend somebody. Or maybe it was offered to an idol. It might offend somebody. In which case, if, if especially among the Gentiles who had been pagans, you know, and they did pagan sacrifices, and they knew you bought it from the market, had it been offered to an idol, it's going to offend them. You're going to think, I'm, off, I'm participating in some sort of pagan ritual by eating something that was part of a pagan sacrifice. This is what the issue of Paul was specifically addressing. With your meat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died because of their conscience. Okay, we'll get on to this. Therefore, do not let your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not in matters of eating and drinking, but rather is in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because the one who serves Christ in these things is well-pleasing to God and acceptable among men. So then you should pursue the things of peace and the things that edify one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of meat or arguing over these things. He has to spend a considerable amount of time talking about you know, this whole thing of what was offered to idols. All things that are lawful are indeed pure, but it is an evil thing for someone to cause an occasion of stumbling through his eating. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or anything else by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak because it was how it was ritually used. He said, Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself in what he approves. You think you can work on the Sabbath? Because you're a firefighter? Is that Okay. Blessed is the one who does not contemn himself in what he approves. But the one who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not a faith, for everything that is not a faith is sin. So here, the apostle is very clearly, he's, he's making something very clear. 
By the way, this whole particular aspect here of, of uh, Romans 14, most translations, common translations these days, are going to say instead of common, they'll say unclean. But you know, they're different words. The Greek word here is koinos. The word for unclean is akarthos. And this is, let's just flip over there and take a quick look just to show you something here. Because people will argue about this. They say, oh, well, you know, um, we can eat anything we want. We don't have to pay attention to the law of God. We can eat pig, we can eat shellfish, we can eat whatever we want. Is that what the scriptures say? In verse, Acts chapter 10 and verse 14, Peter has this vision, and he says very clearly, you know, uh, the voice came to him again saying, he had this vision, arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, in no way, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is koinos or akarthos, that is common or unclean. See, the apostle Peter wasn't eating things that had been a uh, clean animal that had been improperly slaughtered. And he certainly wasn't eating pig. But he, this whole thing, of what the, the point of this whole vision of this cloth, of all this unclean stuff, the creepy crawlies that it was in it, was that he said, you know, from this standpoint, that Peter, he came in, uh, let's see, he realized that God was saying that of a truth I perceive, he said, that God is not a respecter of persons, but in every nation the one who fears him and works righteousness is acceptable for him. He showed him by this vision that, that a human being was not common or unclean. The whole question of going against your conscience is a big one in the Bible. You know, the Apostle Paul had to deal with meat offered to idols. In these days, we might talk more of, do I drink alcohol, do I not drink alcohol? What do I invest, you know, maybe what do I invest in? Do I, what companies do I pick? What job or career do I take? Who do I marry or who do I not marry? Whatever is faith, not of faith, is of sin. From that standpoint, you know, you think of that, God asked the Apostle Jonah to do a job. He gave him a specific assignment to preach to the Assyrians, the Ninevites. These were the people that God was picking out to be the tool of, that he was going to use to punish ancient Israel because they were turning their backs on him. They were refusing to keep the Sabbath. They were refusing to, to, to listen to his word, to follow it anymore. And Jonah knew what they were going to do, but, you know, he, he didn't want to go and preach to the, uh, the Ninevites, the Assyrians. He, he was even seriously afraid they might repent. Did he have faith that God, in the end, that all things will work for good for those who God has a relationship with? Did he have faith? It wasn't of faith. He didn't have faith that God could work it out. So if it was not a faith in this particular case, you know, he didn't have the faith to go and do his job that he was assigned to do. He ran and said the opposite direction. It was sin. <laughs> and you know the whole story of, of you know, the, the whale and the fish or the fish. You know, God prepared the great fish to swallow him up and the storm and the whole thing because he, it wasn't, you know, Jonah couldn't find the faith to preach, to follow the word of what God had, that how somehow through all these things that God would work it out. And of course, he did. For the descendants of the Israelites, he spread all over the world to facilitate the preaching of the gospel. You think about that. Most people don't have a clue what happened to the ten tribes when they dispersed and were scattered abroad. Few do. Few people know. Let's go to Titus. Titus 1 and verse 15. Titus 1 and verse 15. Yes, for everything that is not a faith is sin. Titus 1, 15. To those who are pure, Titus wrote, all things are pure. But to those who are full of sin 
And that is, you know, as the expanded Bible puts it, and I'm citing the expanded Bible here, who are defiled, who are polluted, because that's what sin does to us. It defiles us. Those who are full of sin and do not believe, nothing is pure. Both their minds and consciences have been ruined, or as they would put in their, their margin, defiled or polluted. God gave us a hitchhiker's guide to the universe. He gave us his law in all aspects of our life to teach us so that we would know he gives us the, specific, the, the explicit, but he also has the implicit. And he tells us that we have to be very sensitive to our consciences. We have to be sensitive to understand, you know, how we feel, you know, by the word of God, whether an action and decision we make is of faith or whether it's not. But the fact of whether we are law-keeping as a lifestyle or not is, should not be up for debate ever. We may make mistakes of how we understand and apply scripture in our lives. It's always been a challenge in every century. The Celt ancient Celtic Christians knew they were to keep the law of God. How they were doing it, they would debate about. How do they apply it in specific things? They knew to keep the Sabbath. They knew to keep Passover instead of Easter a week later. They knew those things. They, you know, they, they knew the difference between clean and unclean animals. How they applied that they would, would vary. But we can't kid ourselves. See, God has given us information. He's given us his instruction. He's given us his law. That we can grow into that image and stature of Christ. That we can please him with what we do. That we can be his servants, his slaves on this earth at this time to do good works. He created us for these things. To serve for him and with him. We're not just here to have a good time. <laughs> to do our own thing. Let's go to Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25 and verse 6. And I'm going to close with this. Here in the expanded Bible version. <clears throat> so the Roman proconsul Festus, he stayed in Jerusalem another eight or ten days and then went back down to Caesarea. Okay, he'd been in Jerusalem, you know, and then he went back down to Caesarea. The next day he told the soldiers to bring Paul. You see, there had been all, if you get the context, there had been all this, there had been a riot and all these things because Paul had gone into the temple. He had visited Jerusalem. He would talked to the other apostles and they said to him, you know, all this rumor has come out that, you know, you're teaching against the law and all this. And we know this is baloney. You know this baloney, Paul. So here we have some men who are doing a Nazarite vow because the temple was still standing at that time. It was still there. The Romans hadn't destroyed it yet. So go and do, you know, offer this. And when people, you know, there's some different people uh, from areas that Paul had preached and recognized them. And they were his enemies, his antagonists. And they created a riot and tried to kill him. And anyways, the Romans had pulled them out because they kept the garrison right by the temple to keep an eye on the place because they were trying to keep it all under their thumb. The next day he told the soldiers to bring Paul before him. So he, you know, he was going to find out what the riot was all about. And Festus was seated on the judge's seat in the tribunal. When Paul came into the room, the people who had come down from Jerusalem, his opponents, the Pharisees and scribes, stood around him making serious charges against him, which they could not prove. And this is what Paul said to defend himself before the Roman proconsul. He said this, I have done nothing wrong. That is, I have committed no offense, no sin, no crime against the law or against the temple or even against Caesar. See, Paul, in making his defense for his life, as it were, in a very serious situation, 
you know, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, and anything had he sinned. He made that profession of faith. Can we make the same profession of faith? I hope we can. Because, you know, as, as I open it up, and it's starting to say in Psalm 1, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They will be condemned to the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly. But the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Brethren, do not be deceived. The one who does righteousness is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil.